The No One Is Illegal crowd in the United Nations have declared Jews illegal in their own homelands. But that hasn't stopped the town of Ariel from blooming in the desert. Sheila Gunn Reed for Rebel News, and I'm here in Israel this week on a fact finding mission wherein we are uncovering the lies sold to us through the mainstream media and through our politicians and the United Nations. Now, today I'm in the town of Ariel. Now, if you want to see all of our reports from on the ground, you can go to rebelnewsisrael.com. But more about the town of Ariel. The town of Ariel is a booming place with a robust economy and a real sense of community. It sits in Judea and Samaria, strategically between the border with Jordan and the coast, Tel Aviv. But this town here and 143 other communities just like this one have been deemed illegal by the United Nations and the international community. Because according to the international community, these towns are on disputed West Bank territory. What that means is that these towns built on traditional Jewish lands are places where Jews are not allowed to live, which seems anti-Semitic to me. These communities built on disputed West Bank territory have been called a hindrance to peace, though thanks to the Trump negotiated Abraham Accords, peace has actually broken out in the Middle East. During the Obama years, there was even a ban on construction here in Ariel, but just on Jewish owned homes and businesses not on the Palestinian ones. Ariel, as I said, is strategic militarily, sitting just between Jordan and the coast, but it also is very important in peace efforts, and those efforts are to be achieved through economic prosperity and cooperation. Let's hear more about it. First, when we, when we speak uh, inside, we spoke about um, giving back this land to someone, and, and I asked you guys about give back to who? To Jordan or to maybe to the United Kingdom because this uh, land is, uh, in, by the way, in, under the, the international law, is a land under dispute, not belong to someone officially because it was belong for 19 years from 1948 to 1967 to uh, Jordan, controlled by Jordan. But guess what? In the middle of the 70s, we had a peace agreement with Jordan and uh, Jordan uh, uh, gave up of this land. So this is a no man's land. We should make this uh, uh, under a peace agreement, but it still not belongs to someone. Ariel, by the way, established on a hill who called Jabal Mawa, the hill of death, that no one lived here before. Yeah, it's not a... a so, so you can see more life than death here. So by, by, it's called by the Arab, the hill of death, because they uh, had nothing to grow here in, those, in this uh, stony land. So as an empty land, it's not uh, um, concrete or, I mean, um, uh, occupied it for someone. So that's what makes it more legal than legal. Now, tell us a little bit about Ariel, because you, you just said it was a, a place where nothing could grow, but it's certainly not that anymore. How many people live here? How many people work here? Uh, in your presentation to us, you said the Palestinians come to work here. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us a little bit about your town. So uh, Ariel was founded in 1978 in this empty land uh, by uh, a group of crazy people that call themselves <laughs> the Tel Aviv Nuclear and came here by their own, just uh, in this strategic location, 40 kilometers from the Mediterranean and 40 kilometers from the Jordan Valley, just in the middle between our two borders. You know, we are not Canada, from coast to coast, it's only about 80, uh, um, 80 kilometers, that's it. So just in the middle, in the top of the mountain, you can see uh, Tel Aviv uh, uh, from, from the university, actually. You can see Tel Aviv and to, to have all of these uh, security uh, values. Um, in Ariel, we have 21,000 residents and 16,000 students who come to, uh, to study here from all over. Jews and Arabs and, uh, and from the north and the south of Israel, from everywhere. We're welcoming everybody. You refer to a question about the Palestinian workers. Every day, only in Ariel, we have 5,000 
Palestinian workers, just in Ariel. I'm not speaking about the surrounding um, Jewish communities around us. 5,000 um, uh, Palestinian workers. And when I say workers, it's not just about simple workers in the factory, but also uh, directors and engineers and designers in those factories that come to work here every day. And we believe that that's what makes us, by the way, not just legal, but also um, not an obstacle for peace, but a bridge for peace, but part of the solution. Because we have common interests with them, common interest for economics, for uh, common for uh, common living, for for peace. I want to ask you about that because you mentioned in your presentation that uh, shared goals, common economics, it, that is a bridge for peace. But we hear criticisms about the settlements in the Western world, particularly in universities. There's the whole boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, uh, which is clearly anti-Semitic, saying don't buy things that are It's made. a murder, anti-Semitic. Sure yeah, it is. It's a murder. Um, I want to talk to you about how that actually hurts the people that the BDS NICS uh, claim to help. It really does hurt the Palestinian workers mm -hmm. in these factories. Mm -hmm. i tell you what. First, um, things look different, not just in the media, but also under the neon lights in the universities. And I invite them to come here and to come, like in your visit, to see a factory of Jews and Palestinian works together and to understand who are they boycott, okay? I'm okay as a Jewish, I'm okay with boycotting me, <laughs> but why, why should you do that to those, uh, to those Arabs that that affected by this? The major, uh, most of uh, uh, factories are not damaged by the BDS, out of them, yes. But you know what, the owners are uh, mobile. They right. just moved their factory. But you know who damaged more? The workers that didn't have uh, the, their, their jobs here because they couldn't just move to the north with, uh, with the, the, the factory. So, fortunately, who damaged more than the BDS is that just the simple people, that's the, the workers, uh, the Palestinians, by the way. Do you have a message for the people who say your town should not exist, it shouldn't be here at all because it's illegal, because you're taking land that's disputed, but even though it's the traditional Jewish homeland of Judea and Samaria? Yeah, sure. More than the traditional land, because, you know, when we're speaking about our rights here, is in the, from the old Bible, 80% um, of the biblical stories was happened just here, what's so called in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, and in Bethel and in Shiloh. Um, Joshua, Joshua Grace is just uh, seven miles from here, seven kilometers. You're Canadian, right? And if, <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Anyway, um, so it's not just about our right, but I will tell them, those people, I will invite them to come and see by their eyes. And I know that every visit here is a game changer for people, especially for people who are disagree with me. Because when they see things, not through uh, CNN or BBC, they see things by their eyes. And with the ability to ask the questions Every question, the people, the workers, not just presenters like me, okay? And to see the reality, that's make the whole story. That make the whole difference. That's a game changer. Rebel News is here in Israel this week on a fact-finding mission to see all of our reports from on the ground. Go to rebelnewsisrael.com.